again, welcome and thank you for attending the National Registry Training Officer webinar this morning. We're going to go ahead and get things kicked off and get started um, with the webinar this morning. Um, first off, um, I want to welcome um, you to the Training Officer webinar and we're going to have a few discussions and conversations today um, to get us started. We're going to welcome Mark Terry. He's going to speak um, want to be our, one of our speakers today is the Chief Certification Officer, Megan Holler. She's the Certification Manager, and then also Don Markecki. She's our Customer Experience Manager. Um, and today on our agenda, they'll be discussing some um, things. We're going to cover the National Registry mission. We're going to go over and talk about some policy updates, um, the recent and upcoming fee changes, we're going to explain and um, show the active to inactive functionality um, for recertification. And then we're also going to give you some available resources um, to help you through the, the 2022 recertification season. So a few housekeeping things that we are to cover before we um, go on today. Today's webinar is going to run about a maximum of 75 minutes. This webinar is recorded and we will make, um, we'll be sending you an email with a link to on our YouTube channel um, where you'll be able to review, review the webinar as, as you would like to, or you could uh, share it with other training officers around you um, as you would like to. And during the webinar, there is going to be a Q&A session at the end. So please submit your um, questions during the webinar and we'll get to them at the end. Um, just to remember that we do have a lot of participants today. So if we don't get to your question, um, we'll uh, reach up, reach back out to you via email if we don't get to your question at, at, during the Q question and answer session. So first, um, I want to talk about the National Registry's mission. Um, it is our mission to provide a valid uniform process to assess the knowledge and skills required for competent practice by EMS professionals throughout your, your careers, everyone's career, and make sure that uh, to maintain the current registry status um, through, our, for our, through our mission. I'm going to pass things off to Mark Terry. Thank you, Lauren. Next slide, please. We wanted to start off by thanking you as training officers uh, for your work as a training officer as we go into the upcoming 2022 recertification season for EMTs, advanced EMTs, and paramedics. Your work as a training officer is a vital component of competency assurance and verification of continuing education that builds the value and the credibility of continued National Registry certification. So on behalf of the EMS community, thank you for your work in ensuring that at a local level. Next slide, please. At the June 9th, 2021 National Registry Board of Directors meeting, the board passed several policies related to eligibility, certification, and recertification. As is our standard practice at the National Registry, those policies after the board meeting were then shared with the public for a 60 day public comment period, whereas all the information was posted up on the website and we asked for comments from members of the community and interested stakeholders. Those comments have now been received. The board has uh, reviewed those comments and we are now moving into the implementation phases and able to share with you the implementation phase, including some of the modifications that were made as a result of comments that we received during this important notification period. Thank you for all of you that shared your comments and impressions and for the future, the board meetings are regularly scheduled for June and November of each year, and the policies and resolutions are then posted up on the website for public comment to be able to share your uh, insights and your perspectives on what those board actions would have for the EMS community. Next slide, please. One of the resolutions that was passed by the board was a recognition of a new 
designation for continuing education that has been put into place by the Commission on the Accreditation of Pre-Hospital Continuing Education, that is the F4 designation. This is a de designation that's used for technologically advanced continuing education programs in which the student interacts with the activity in such a way that their actions and choices dictate and form the direction of the activity or case. This one example of this would be a virtual simulation in which the case proceeds according to the choices that are made and it requires continuous interaction between the student and the educational program. Adaptive learning is another platform that uses this particular approach and receives the F4 designation. The F4 designation is recognized by the National Registry as a non-distributive education format that can be used in any of the areas for the recertification platform. Another change that was made by the Board of Directors was a modification to the National Registry appeals policies, which allows candidates to appeal adverse decisions. And in the past, the final step of that appeals process was the ability to attend a hearing in person um, with the National Registry to improve accessibility to the appeals process and recognizing that the technology has advanced and is used by all of us, including on platforms such as this webinar, we've recognized that we need to include that in the appeals process and for and now appeals appellants can attend hearings either in person or by electronic video means. The next resolution that was passed related to fitness to practice, specifically the evaluation of criminal convictions. It's been a long-standing practice of the National Registry to evaluate criminal convictions as a part of certification and recertification pathways. A recent survey by the National Association of State EMS officials showed that all 50 states are now including and using an evaluation of criminal convictions at a state licensure level, which now allows the National Registry to move away from evaluating criminal convictions in the certification process. This is a gradual process to make sure that all of the licensure systems and certification systems are able to accommodate that change. And that process will be changing over the next two to three years as the states move uh, and improve and increase their criminal conviction records in the National Registry is then able to recognize and move away from that. The next resolution that I'll cover relates specifically to the recertification season for 2022. Recognizing the ongoing pandemic conditions and impact on continuing education, the Board of Directors has again waived the distributive education limits for continuing education for the 2022 recertification season while uh, anticipating a return to those limits for the 2023 recertification season. There is also a, a, a task force that has been convened looking at recertification and continued competency initiatives and distributive education is being considered by that group for a more permanent solution, but that would not be anticipated for a couple of years. So with that, I'll turn it over to Megan to discuss a few other topics. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. And training officers, I'll echo what Mark says. So thank you for all that you do. And it's been great working with you all. And I look forward to this upcoming recertification season. I'm going to discuss some of the policy updates that were passed at this last June board meeting. So the same policies that were passed at this June board meeting that Mark had just discussed. These were also passed at that time. So again, these also went through the public comment period and have uh, just been ratified. So. We'd like to discuss the recertification audits policy first, and that one is up first. The recertification audits policy is, um, previously we, we had one. It was about a paragraph long on the website, but now it more aligns in this new policy update with our current practice and what we've always done. So not a lot of significant changes for our practice. It's just documenting our practice. All of these policies, if you want to follow along, though, you can go to the National Registry's website about us. If you click on the public notices and find the public comment, those are still posted there. You can't comment 
on those, uh, the comment period is closed, but they are still posted if you'd like to review those. So the research audits policy, this is intended specifically for recertification. It is not for any audits of an initial certification. The scope lies within uh, recertification, but also with some of the state licensed onlys that we deal with um, from certain states if we are um, handling some of their state licenses as well. And that is in a direct partnership with those state EMS offices specifically. With the policy, we've outlined three different categories of audits. So the first level of audit is the manual audit. That is what you're used to. That is complete generation. Um, it's automatically done, ran, uh, man, random sampling. Oh, excuse me. So level one is actually the man, uh, manual. So that is stuff that the staff actually reviews. So that's the stuff, um, the research applications that you submit and the staff just uh, ends up reviewing those and processing those. That is a normal process that occurs um, every year. So if you are returned and complete, maybe if you are approved and accepted, typically that is done by staff members looking at those recertification audits to make sure that each application met those recertification requirements. The level two audit is the one that is computerized. It's randomly selected and that's based on just a random sampling and algorithm. And I know many of you guys say it's not. You feel very personal about it, but I can promise you it is computerized. It is random sampling. The level three audit describes something that would be for cause. So if the National Registry gets a report about a potential misconduct or a potential application that was not accurate and maybe somebody had you know, entered some education that was not truthful, we have reason to go ahead and investigate those. And so that level three audit allows us to investigate and conduct investigations due to cause. And so sometimes you can get an audit request based on um, an investigation. So those are those um, types of audits. EMR can be audited between April 1st and October 31st and EMT, AEMT and paramedic you can be audited between October 1st and April 30th. So that does cover those 30 days of that reinstatement period as well. There is one chain, one major change to this recertification audits policy. If you are not able to provide documentation to support your audit, you will be allowed to use the recertification by exam in lieu of turning in those documents. Now, that does not necessarily mean that you can try to turn in your documents and that we find that they don't meet satisfaction and then you want to go for the research by exam. This would be something that's up front. So if you say, hey, in lieu of turning in documentation, I just want to go take the research by exam, we will allow you to do that. And that will satisfy your audit if you pass that examination. The next policy we'll discuss is the accepted education and documentation policy. So this policy is again, just typical practice that we've had at the National Registry. A lot of this was documented in the recertification guide. If you're familiar with the training officer guide or research guide um, uh, posted on the training officer website. So a lot of this just got formalized into a single policy. This policy is for recertification, the re-entry, and the state license entry. So it does, uh, it does impact the initial certification pathways. The National Registry does not approve education, but remember we do review education. All education must follow the NCCP guidelines and as required by the certification schemes. The certification schemes we'll discuss here in a moment. And the accepted eligible timeframes for the use of the education is listed within this policy. So for example, certification, it must be within your certification cycle date. If you're using it for the reentry pathway or the state licensed entry, the education must be dated since the last course completed um, following for that course eligibility. We do also discuss the sources allowed for education that we accept. That's the US State EMS Office approved academic credit. Academic credit is also um, termed college credits. CAPSI accredited education and education outlined by our National Registry academic credit policies, alternative credit policies. 
Those policies can be found under our policy website um, on the National Registry website. Education not accepted is also covered. This actually did not change. So if you're familiar with the education not accepted in the recertification guide, this is copied over. It is the same. So this includes stuff like working, volunteer time, performance of duty, your instructor methodology courses, so courses that you take to become the instructor, serving as the skills examiner or a participant, and then those duplicate courses so that you taught CPR and you also took CPR, or maybe you took two CPR courses. We will only count one per cycle, for example. We also don't accept anything for management and leadership courses and hours that you did for precepting. So we're happy to take questions on any of those if you get a question on what is and is not accepted. Some new areas to this um, accepted education and documentation policy is the proof of education with required components. So all education for proof of the proof must minimally include the name of the individual, the date of the course completion, the number of credits, hours, or CE awarded, what was the scope? So what did the course topic, the course name or content covered? The name of the certificate issuer, so your provider or training name, either a CAP C number, if that's available. Who was the approver? So did CAP C approve this? Did your state EMS office approve this? The method of instruction, and that goes along with the CAP C course numbers available as distributive or non-distributive. The proof of education in the format is also new, so please check this out as well. So we will accept a certificate of completion. However, a change will be that the copies of the standardized courses will no longer be accepted. So we actually need the certificate of the standardized card course that has the number of hours or CEU that's attached to that. The reason why, and that's the exact reason why we don't accept the standardized card courses anymore. And that'll be after April 1st of 2022. So April 1st of 2022, this is implemented. We'll take a roster that includes all data elements. We'll take a, a data import directly into the National Registry transcript, such as the CAPC imports. An official transcript such as like college or an EMS program, a downloaded report as well through the education provider or the platform. So if you're doing something with um, a vendor, for instance, and they're able to provide all of those data areas, we'll accept that as well. We will not accept a single letter of completion that, um, you know, Tommy has completed all of his education. Please accept this as proof signed. Dear training officer, that is something that we will not accept. We do need um, all the other points there. So that is the recertification or sorry, the accepted education and documentation policy. It does again impact re recertification, reentry and state licensed. So the next one is the academic credit policy. This again was vaguely described in the recertification uh, guide. So or the TO guide that we used to call that. So this is just again more formalized. You can um, go ahead and look through that policy. One policy change is previously it was one to eight. So with that we would issue eight CEUs per every one college credit. And this we've changed it to one to 10, a one to 10 ratio. And that is uh, per the US Department of Education. That will be uh, coming in line with on that. Please know that with and using academic credit, you do need an official transcript as your proof if you're using that. It does have to be a course that is completed satisfactorily. If you are using a college class, it must also go in the local or individual component. It cannot be used in the national component with the exception of one type of college course, and that is a full EMS program. So if you are taking a, a full program, EMS program, such as you're an EMT, take an AEMT or paramedic, then you will be allowed to use that in the national component. Um, and I think that so and then, you know, we do say academic credit for the most part, it must be direct patient care EMS related, so directly applies to EMS patient care. 
so if you guys have questions on what that means, we're happy to work through that and you guys can email us or we'll talk to you about that. On to the certification schemes. So the certification schemes are policies that have been here since at least 2020, about April of 2020 is when we implemented these. Certification schemes are a requirement for our accreditation. And what they do is outline the job tasks the for the level, the required competence, required abilities, prerequisites, and any applicable code of conduct as well, including the scope of that certification. So that basically outlines exactly what we're looking for in order to gain certification in different pathways. And also you'll have the maintenance of recertification if you wish. We have one available for all four levels. And that one was just updated with just some rewording, very minor. There's no fundamental changes to that. And lastly, the PPWI examination. So PPWI is policies, procedures, and work instructions. These were a set of 27 policies that were uh, basically passed in a package deal. Uh, this took us almost a year and a half to complete. And basically this project was taking all of the current practices for the examinations team and just documenting them. So we found that we had gaps in some policies that were not well documented or not were not completely transparent. One of our values at registry is the transparency. And so this project took and documented 27 different policies related to examination development, exam administration, the scoring and examination results and impartiality. So we've historically had these policies and procedures or the processes in place to address all of these. But again, it formally centralizes and adopts those. Um, it also aligns them with the standards for educational and psychological testing. So we'll be happy to take any questions on any one of those 27. There were no major changes. It's just, again, documenting our current practices. So please check those out if you have any questions. I will say the recertification audits, the accepted education and documentation, and the academic credit are being implemented again April 1st of 2022. So we'll do a soft implementation at this time. We'll send out a lot of communication and a lot of reminders for these, but please familiar yourself with those policies. Lauren, next slide. And I'll turn it over to Don for the fee changes. Thank you, Megan. Good morning, everyone. There is a fee increase for the 2022 recertification season. The effective date is January 1 of 2022. Uh, we definitely encourage everyone to pay and submit by December 31st, 2021 to take advantage of the lower rate. The reinstatement fee and the paper processing fee will remain the same. So as you can see on the, the table, there is no change in that fee. We will honor the current 2021 fee if someone pays and submits their app by December 31st of 2021. If someone pays and submits their app on or after January 1st of 2022, they will pay the new price. If someone pays before December 31st, but does not submit until after January 1st, they must pay the additional amount before submitting their application. Please encourage your providers to submit early to take advantage of the lower rates. And I'm going to turn it back over to Megan. Thank you, Don. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about the inactive and active statuses. Um, I know that's controversial and a difficult concept at times. So the active status is not required for national certification. So you can have and maintain the inactive status and that does not hurt, harm in any way your national certification or jeopardize that. So you can stay in the inactive status for as long as you want with no problem and continue to recertify in the inactive status. However, the active status um, does require the agency affiliation, a training officer approval at all levels, and then the medical director, which is a physician approval, at the AEMT and paramedic level. Please know that some states uh, do require active status, so please check on your regulations or with your state EMS office on some of those states. I knew one example is Massachusetts, who does require the active status, 
but I will say the National Registry has little ability for enforcement of those. So please make sure that if you're a training officer in one of those states, check your regulations and make sure you're signing your people off and uh, making sure that they're affiliated with your agency. Inactive status is also now available for the EMR as of April 1st of 2021. So this will be our first recertification cycle. We're just finishing up with the inactive status for EMR. This makes all levels, EMR, EMT, AMT, and paramedic, all equal with the inactive and active status abilities. As a training officer, you can change from inactive to active status electronically and instantly. You no longer have to fill out those paper forms and send those into us for our processing. So if you want that done instantly, please encourage uh, your providers to make sure that they're affiliated and that you can just select one single button and automatically they're flipped over back to active status. Lauren, next page, please. I think you jumped too. Okay, so this is the provider page and this is what it should look like um, for a provider when they log in on their dashboard. This is a screenshot. They'll click on, so they'll log into the My Certification page. They'll click on that inactive to active where that red arrow is. And once they go to that red arrow, they have uh, an inactive to active status page. So that's the page, the section on the right. And it has a little note in there in order to become active status, you have to be affiliated with the agency or training officer or medical director needs to sign you off. So it has a little blurb if you ever forget on what active status is and needs. For that provider, they will find their agency. If they're not already connected with their agency, it will prompt them to affiliate with the agency first and then they'll have to go back in and request the active status. For this person, they are a pending request so they can request that active status. This is the provider dashboards. And the next page, we'll talk about the training officer medical director dashboard. So this is what you guys see on your end. So you will click on very similar to on that left side and active to active status. Once that comes up, you'll see a roster view. So you'll end up clicking on the approve button. You can do that at the top in the blue, which will approve everybody, or you can click on each name individually and approve them and hit submit. Once you hit submit, then suddenly and instantly they become active status. Lauren, go ahead next, that next page. And these are what your dashboards look like. So once you log into that training officer role, then at the top, you do have the ability on a quick view to look at the inactive to active requests and it will show zero. Maybe it'll show one, two, maybe it'll show 20, but that'll show you on a quick view how many that you need to do. And you can click that view. It'll take you over to that roster page that we were just talking about. On the my certification or provider role, they'll see that they are affiliated with an agency. They can change affiliations. They can add or remove an affiliation there as well if they need to. And if they have that verification by a training officer or medical director, that will show up under the verification right there on under the bottom. It says verified date, verified by the role in the agency. And we're also able to tell who verified on what date and what time if you ever have that question. The status, when you're in active status, does show recertified. It does not show active. If you're in active status, it does say inactive on that status. So that's an example there of the status is recertified, which means they're active status, that person. So Lauren, go ahead with the next. All right, I'll turn it back over to Lauren. I think it's done. So we have many resources available for you for the upcoming recertification season. Uh, the first one we're going to focus on is the training officer web page. So you can access this by going to our home page and under the partners section, you'll want to click the training officer option and you can it will take you to the training officer page. We have videos about how to add a course and how to approve education. So it's a really nice overview of how that process works. 
Uh, the recertif recertification guide is available, and that's really a nuts and bolts of the recertification process and more information about NCCP, our policies, and education requirements. There's a lot of good information in there, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. The standardized course guide is also available on that page, and what that is is a document that breaks down a lot of the standardized courses such as CPR, ACLS, PALS, PHTLS, any of those types of courses, and it shows in which um, categories you can apply those to for the national component. There's also step-by-step -step guides on frequently asked questions for training officers towards the bottom of the page. There's a lot of great questions on there, so if you're unsure about how to um, affiliate with your or how to add your agency, add the training officer role, uh, how to do some of the basic training officer functions, there's a lot of resources on that page that can definitely help you. So the second option available is our support center, and you can access that by going to the footer of our website and click the contact us link or the contact link, and it will take you to the support page. So we have frequently asked questions um, for all certification and recertification, but specifically there's a lot of great recertification questions on there, question and answers that will help you. The recertification guide that I mentioned and the standardized course guide are also available on there as resources for you, so check that out there as well. And then lastly, for the support page, we have quick tip documents for both certification and recertification, but the recertification is a recertification checklist, and it's all of the steps that a provider would need to do to complete the recertification process. So it might be helpful if you want to print that out and pass it out at your agency and give it to all the individuals that are due to recertify as kind of a how-to guide so they don't miss any steps along the process. We have phone support available. We have stakeholder specialists that are ready to answer your questions. When you call in, if you push option one on the phone tree menu, um, we have individuals that are available to help you with any questions you have about recertification. And then lastly, you can email your question to support at nremt.org, and one of our specialists will get back to you with your questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lauren. Thank you, John. Um, right now we're going to go to the question and um, answer segment of our webinar. So you have some really good questions going on. Um, so Megan, uh, Mark, Don, please feel free to, to comment as I, I read some of the questions. Um, someone asked, they understand college leadership and management courses are, do not count as part of recertification, but do um, does this broad definition include diversity and inclusion courses? It can, and it might be able to include some of the diversity and inclusion courses. We just ask that all courses are EMS direct patient care related. So as long as you can justify that direct patient care EMS related, then that might be able to include the diversity and inclusion courses. Thanks, Megan. I'd also jump in on that and say that um, in particular in the individual component of the recertification platform, broad latitude is allowed for the uh, appropriateness of the education to the specific environment. And so many um, uh, diversity and inclusion courses could well fit within the individual component of that, um, but, there, um, uh, but may not be appropriate, for instance, for the national component, which are tied to specific objectives. Okay, and there's another one. Um, I think May Megan, you mentioned the question is, did you say that the NIMT will not accept the standardized card courses after 401 of 2022? So the National Registry will need a certificate that's accompanying that card course or will need a document that shows the number of continuing education credits. On that, at this time, standardized card courses or copy of those do not reflect how many hours that were awarded or CE credits, 
that were awarded for that course, and that's the challenge with that. So it doesn't also state that it's an initial course usually or a recertification course, and that's where our challenges lie. So I think the question seems to be, Megan, it's more about the documentation. It's not the course. The courses are acceptable. It's that's just the card is not sufficient documentation of it. That's correct. All right, our next question is, is, so take an anatomy class at college, will it count towards CE? Continuing education, sorry. I think that it falls along the same guidelines. So each, we understand anatomy and physiology are typically pretty standard, but each college and each course is really difficult to, um, you know, every syllabus could be different, how the instruction is different, lab versus course versus online. So it's really hard for the National Registry to say, like I said, we'll be happy. We don't really approve your education. We're happy to review your education. But again, it just needs to meet the, the standards of EMS patient care specific. If you can justify that, um, we'll be happy to review that for you. And again, you know, that individual course that needs to be EMS focused is can pretty much always take those courses there if you have any questions. OK, so here's a good one. Uh, who signs off on your skills if you're the training officer? That's a great question. So if you have another training officer, or somebody that is designated to be a secondary or your backup training officer, that's the most ideal situation. So you might be the primary training officer, but if you can add somebody else that you trust in that training officer role as your backup, that person should be the one to sign you off. The other option is if you have a physician medical director, they could also assume and request the role of a training officer, and they could also sign you off as the training officer role and as the medical director role both, and that's okay as well. We definitely prefer you not to sign yourself off, um, probably for obvious reasons, but it is better to have, you know, just to add somebody under that role if you can. All right, I see a few questions here um, about rosters. So for reef certification, are electronic class rosters with attestation acceptable or do the rosters need to be copies of wet ink type rosters? Yeah, so we're okay with the electronic. We're okay with the wet ink type rosters. Um, I believe that is referred to the handwritten ones, if, if I'm understanding that correctly. We're okay with any type of rosters as long as those rosters contain all of the other data points, such as, you know, the name, the date, the number of CEs, the approver who taught the class. As long as they have all of those other components that are required, we can take that roster. I think one of the things that I'd add on to that also is a couple of other, other points, Megan. Um, one is, is remember that anything that is CAPSI accredited can also be uploaded directly into our database from the CAPSI database. And if we see evidence of upload, that does not require additional documentation because that is coming directly from a CAPSI database. Um, and so particularly in a, um, uh, most of the standardized courses are carrying CAPSI accreditation. Those have all of the required data elements because we can tie back and we know that the records are legitimate because of the particular, um, because it came from a verified database source. Um, the elements on the questions on certificates and rosters are really designed around fraud prevention and making sure that we're getting adequate documentation uh, of the continuing education. We recognize that there are a number of fine tuning components that will need to be done, which is why we're putting a very long lead time on this to make sure that we're giving you as the training officers the ability to update your components for those rosters um, and those certificates to make sure that we're including all of the required document components. Um, but what we're really looking for here is the ability to provide verified documentation that the courses have been completed in a way um, that can be um, easily identified. Okay, thank you. Um, 
There is a question here. The question is, did I understand that CAPC courses are now not considered distributive? I can take that one. No, CAPC courses may or may not be distributive education. It depends on the designation that the CAPC course has. So for instance, a CAPC F1 designation is a synchronous event where the instructor and the student are interacting in real time, as is the F5 designation. Those are both considered non-distributive education, as is the F4 designation. However, the F3 designation by CAPSI is a reflection of a distributive education format that has a slightly different set of definitions and standards for that, and that is considered, the F3 designation is considered distributive education by CAPSI. The other, the other designations by CAPSI are not considered distributive. Great question, though. OK, um, there's a question here. Many of the terms National Registry uses are not used locally. National Component, Distributive Education, CAPC, et cetera. Is there somewhere these terms are clearly defined? I could jump in on that one. One great guide for that is the recertification guide that is found on the training officer section of the National Registry website. And remember what we're talking about here are components for National Registry recertification. And so we can provide some definitions for that. CAPSI is the Commission on the Accreditation for Pre-Hospital Continuing Education. That's a national organization that accredits continuing education nationally. Um, and then uh, there are three components of the National Registry recertification. One of those is the national component, which has the defined categories and objectives for continuing education. Then there is a local component, which is specified by the state, local, or uh, agency level. And then there is an individual component that is left up to the individual certificate or registrant to, def uh, to determine what continuing education is appropriate. But many of those topics are covered in the recertification guide that's available on the National Registry website. Thank you. Um, someone asked, is there a place where the data points for certificates are listed or can Megan say them again, but slower? Yes, not a problem. If, again, if you guys go to the NREMT website and about us, once you get there, you'll see a public comment. And we still have those posted there for review under those uh, June policies. And you can review them there if you would like to have your copy now. Um, otherwise, those will be formalized and placed on the website here soon under the policies page. And you're asking for the data points for certification. And so that would be, it's um, the name of the individual, the date of the course that was completed, the number of credits or hours or continuing education that was awarded, what's the scope, so the topic, the course name or description of the content covered, what's the name of the certificate issuer, so that would be the training provider's name or the CAPC provider company, organization. You can add the CAPC num provider number if able. Name of the course approver, which would be like CAPC, that state EMS office, an academic institution, so a college or credit, or the National Registry Alternative uh, Credits Policy. And then the method of instruction. So was it a CAPC course number? Can you provide distributive or non-distributive? Was it a virtual instructor-led training course, a built course maybe? 
was it in classroom physically altogether? So some sort of method of instruction, if you can include that as well. So that is the requirements to be on any of those documentations. The documentations, again, that we accept, the certificate of completion, the roster that includes those data elements I just listed, the data which is imported directly into the National Registry transcript, that would be like the CAPC imports, the official transcript from an accredited school or university or state approved EMS program, or the downloaded report of a completed education through the educational provider or the platform that uh, you may you may have and that will contain the name and signature of the verifying training officer as well as all those data points so those are the requirements there and they are on that policy Thank you, Megan. Um, one of the last few questions we have here says, what if you have a, a medical director that also wishes to keep their National Registry paramedic card? Can we use the CME she gets as an MD and apply that to their National Registry certification? Yeah, so we have um, we do accept anything that is, you know, state approved. So if for that person specifically, we don't have a, a documentation or something on the national scale that says this uh, physician credit or this nursing credit or PA credit translates into EMS. So there's really no, ex almost like an exchange rate. There's really no exchange for EMS and how that um, corresponds. But what I would ask is that if your, your MD education is accepted by your state EMS office, um, just do a quick check and say, hey, will you endorse this or are you going to accept this as well? If you can use that for your state license for renewal, then we should be able to accept that as well. Um, as long as it, again, you know, is EMS patient care related, which I'm going to say probably as an MD, most of your courses are. So, yeah, we're happy to work with you individually if you have questions on that, though. Thank you, Megan, Mark, and Don. We're gonna. That was all the questions we had today. If you have more, please feel free to uh, email us at uh, support at nrmt.org with any questions that you might have after the webinar. Um, again, please watch out. We will be having um, numerous um, webinar training officer webinars throughout um, the 2022. Uh, recertification season. Um, so it'll be, uh, I think we're going to have about three to four more um, between now and the end of recertification season. Thank you again for joining the webinar today and we hope that we found you found the information useful. Thank you. Have a great day.